you know, I mentioned that, uh, like Eric, I had some doubt about the theory of anticipatory self-defense. I don't think it's well established. Uh, uh, however, my thought was that if Israel were to justify this, it would look at the fact that it is already subject to actual attacks by Iran on a continuing basis. And the question would be whether these attacks, which clearly justify some response, would justify the response of uh, destroying nuclear facilities. Um, I guess the counterpoint would then be, uh, could Iran attack Israel based on Israel's attacks on Iran? Well, the fact is, actually, I think there are, have been some attacks uh, by Israel on Iran. I mean, there's the, uh, the Iranian nuclear scientist who was mysteriously uh, assassinated. Uh, I, there may be other attacks that we don't know about. These aren't as likely to be reported in the uh, New York Times uh, or the Jerusalem Post. Uh, uh, but I think that uh, I think it would be a two-way uh, street that goes there. Now, I think if you recognize the defense of anticipatory uh, self-defense, um, yeah, I think it's it's an important question. After all, I think uh, uh, Iran probably faces more likelihood of being attacked by Israel at this moment than Israel does uh, being attacked by uh, uh, by Iran. So, uh, I think it would have to be a two-way street. I, again, I have similar difficulties with this theory of anticipatory self-defense. I agree with what Eric said. It seems reasonable in many cases, but it's difficult to cabin, and it hasn't been widely accepted. So, yeah, I mean, it's a very good question. We have the same problem in, in domestic law, and, and domestic law is similarly very strict. That is, you can't, even though you're, you're, you know, you're pretty confident that somebody doesn't like you and, and might try to kill you and the person has issued threats to you, you're not allowed to kill that person in anticipatory self-defense. That's simply uh, not, not permitted. Um, yeah, I know, it, it could, it might, it's inconvenient, inconvenient, I'm afraid, but true. And and this um, this this has been carried over to international law. I think for for the reasons uh, that I, that I described before. So it would have to be now language could matter and rhetoric could matter, but it would have to be the case that this the threat was accompanied by actual mobilization and and the use of uh, of military force or the imminent use of military force. Now this gets back to the issue raised by Ed maybe the the rules are bad and 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 that we could sort of reformulate self defense uh norms so that they're broader they allow uh forms of anticipatory self defense but the rules are 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 sufficiently um well defined so as to prevent uh manipulation or 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 to um embrace too many types of, of, of action. So you could imagine, you know, lawyers sitting down and saying, well, if they have nuclear weapons and they have a history of, of supporting terrorists and they actually threaten to wipe a state off the map, you know, then uh, maybe uh, some kind of anticipatory self-defense may be justified. That might be a good argument. I, I don't know. But the, but the fact is, is that the law, you know, just doesn't permit that uh, right now. And as lawyers, I guess we have to stick with that point. The relevance of WMD in this discussion is, uh, I mean, it is, I think it's a, a, a rule changer, it's a game changer, it, um, and that's why my, I'm, I basically take the position that the uh, customary rules of um, international law to the extent that they exist, um, that were formulated in the days of prior to um, nuclear uh, weaponry is or really aren't relevant because of the difficulties of the things that you cite such as um, if you wait too long the the collateral damage from taking out the facilities and so forth is even worse and then of course if you don't take them out the the consequences are even worse um, you know, this whole question of uh, proof and so forth, I think it just goes to this, just the nature of the difficulty of this issue. And it's um, the, you know, the court that this case is going to be tried before is the court of public opinion. And you've got to have a very convincing case. And uh, we see the consequences of not having a convincing case uh, and the fallout of over the sort of undercutting of the legitimacy of our action in Iraq in uh, 2003. And my question is, uh, I found this very interesting, and I'm sure that at some level <coughs> uh, in Israel and in the United States there's people debating this, uh, uh, what, what lawful actions they, they could do. Do you think that there's a similar panel going on in Tehran on what, what constrains them uh, with regards to international law? And if there isn't, what use is arguing over these technicalities if it only restrains the good guys uh, from attacking uh, and, and allows the bad guys to get away with things? Tough question. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if uh, uh, 
you know, I don't, I don't know that it's uh, always the case that uh, we have to worry about what Iran does because, of course, there will be other enemies and others who will uh, follow the same rules. You know, I think that um, I think that one part of international law that is very important is the right of self-defense. I mean, it's the right of self-defense that keeps us safe most of the time. After all, uh, no one attacks the United States, uh, and it's not because uh, there's a piece of paper, Article 2.4, which says uh, you can't use force. Uh, no one attacks the United States because they know we'll hit them back. Uh, and so I think uh, that, uh, you know, they may not uh, be debating whether it's lawful on a piece of paper, but I think they are debating, you know, what would be the consequence and what would be a lawful consequence that might be pursued against them if they did it. Yeah, I, I think they probably are having that debate. It's not because they, they think that international law is wonderful. I, I'm not sure that we or the people who make decisions in the American government think that either. I think what they're going to be concerned about are the consequences of taking any particular course of action. And sometimes those consequences will be a function of what the law is. Sometimes they won't, right? And so they'll have to take into account both of those uh, issues. That's why I said earlier um, when I talked about this hypothetical attack by Israel against uh, Iran, that one should keep in, keep in mind the consequences. And if other countries don't care about the international law violation, that which appears to have been the case with Syria, with the uh, intervention in Syria, it may well be reasonable. It may be morally reasonable. It may be uh, pragmatically reasonable to go ahead uh, with, with, with the intervention. But sometimes countries do uh, take these rules seriously. And the challenge is to figure out the circumstances under which they do take them seriously. That's part of the legal analysis if it's done properly. And then to take into account those consequences when deciding on, on a course of action. And I think the Iranians are, you know, they engage in realpolitik like everybody else. And to the extent that uh, international laws will affect uh, the actions of their potential adversaries, uh, they'll, they'll take that into account and want to know what it is. I say one more word on that. And in fact, I think uh, the last quote that I read in, uh, uh, when I was presenting my paper was exactly that, that the documents taken from, uh, uh, from the Iraqis, uh, from the Iranians in Iraq showed that they had changed their policy of using Iranian agents in Iraq and to uh, using Iraqis who they had trained in Iran and sent back precisely because they thought the United States would retaliate uh, if they used uh, Iranians. So I think they are thinking about this and it has changed their policies.